Okay, hi everybody. I'm Rena. My name is Rena Batia, and I'm part of the class of 2009. And I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speakers, Bryn um, Pane Burkhart and Chris Bolzen. Bryn um, is the associate director of the career uh, alumni career development within the, the MIT Sloan uh, Career Development Office. In her part-time role, she works with all MIT Sloan graduate students to provide career gra guidance relate to job searches. Uh, job search strategies, career transitions, networking and interview um, preparation, and how to develop effective resumes, cover letters, um, and LinkedIn profiles. Bryn has been at the MIT Sloan, MIT Sloan for eight years prior to her current role, managing employer rela um, relations and recruiting in the CDO, and she has worked in the international and graduate student business education for 16 years. Chris Bolzen, who's our other speaker, she has been working at MIT Sloan CDO for four years, providing career advising to the MS, MS program, which I had to ask about. So that's the Masters of Science and Management Studies. It's a, new, it's a program that's four years old. So given that most people here are coming back for at least fifth year union or higher might not know that. Um, but they're all the one year reunions as well. Um, Working in career education team on um, career education on strategies for leveraging social media and job searching, delivering LinkedIn presentations to many of the MIT Sloan degree populations. Previously, Chris worked as an executive search for private equity and venture cap firms, um, spend spending six years at J.P. Morgan. So please join me in re welcoming Bryn and Chris um, up here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to campus. It's always exciting to have you back. This is a fun time of year for us, so it's good to see you and good to see some familiar faces. Chris and I are looking forward to making you more LinkedIn savvy in the next hour and a half. So let me start by asking a couple questions. Is there anybody here who is not on LinkedIn, who does not have a LinkedIn profile? Okay, good. So we're all using the same similar framework. That's great. Um, has anybody used LinkedIn um, to recruit talent for their company? Good, your company might use them. Anybody use LinkedIn to look for a job? Great. And what about kind of doing business development or sourcing sales leads if you're in that sort of role for your company? Super. So you can do, uh, you can use LinkedIn effectively to do all those things and we'll touch on that today. Chris and I feel very strongly that LinkedIn has been a game changer in terms of how people manage their career. Really for two reasons. First, um, it provides an incredibly powerful platform for you to connect with others professionally and to build and grow and manage your own professional network. But secondly, it is a rich resource for recruiters and companies who are looking to hire talent. So we know that small startups to Fortune 500 companies are using LinkedIn. Um, just one little figure, 60, almost 60% of LinkedIn's revenue comes from the sale of their corporate talent solutions. So these are really robust search tools that enable companies to cull through talent and identify active talent, but also passive talent. And what I mean by passive talent is when you actually create a LinkedIn profile, you are essentially putting yourself into a global resume database. So, and we know that companies are looking at your LinkedIn profile in addition to resumes for those of you who might be job seeking. So, you know, LinkedIn used to kind of be a nice to have, now I'd say it's a need to have um, in, in terms of how you're gonna manage your career. Also, I think for anybody who is job seeking, it's critical part of your job search strategy as well. So, so today we're gonna talk about how to optimize your profile, um, regardless of whether or not you're job seeking. We'll look at how to optimize your profile. Um, we'll also look at different features of the site, help you learn how to manage your connections, grow your network, and um, leverage different things to get other features of the site to get corporate intelligence, um, do some research, and um, find out about job opportunities. So, all right. Let's take a look at stats on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is now 11 years old. It started in the living room, four guys sitting around with an idea. And now it's grown to 300 million users. The site claims that a new uh, member joins every two seconds. I would say that's true. The last time we did this presentation, the site had 277 million members when you looked at its um, stats. So that's grown quite a bit in the past um, eight weeks. 
it is incredibly international in scope. So about one third of the users are in the United States. 67% are outside. It's available in over 200 countries and territories and available in 21 languages, so very global. There are three million company pages on LinkedIn. We'll look at company pages a little bit more in depth later, but those are great for companies to brand themselves, to engage with followers. There are over 150 industries represented on LinkedIn as well. Um, there are executives from Fortune 500, every Fortune 500 company. And as I mentioned earlier, the corporate talent solutions that LinkedIn sells um, are bought by 89 of the Fortune 100 companies. Just to give you an example um, of the kind of money that they're bringing in, a couple years ago I was in D.C. Is anybody here from D.C.? Okay, so the MIT Alumni Club of D.C. does a career workshop every March. So two years ago, don't know if you guys were there, we had a career workshop and one of the panelists was the head of talent acquisition at Northrop Grumman, which is a large global defense company. And so she told us her company pays $5 million a year to LinkedIn to source all of their VP level talent. So that's just an example. I know there are other companies that pay double and even triple that to source talent via LinkedIn's recruiting tools. So, um, you know, in the CDO, we're always telling our students, build your network before you need it, right? And so you can't deny that LinkedIn gives you a great platform for doing so. Um, the last figure I wanted to touch on is the 60,000 college and university alumni groups. How many people are members of the MIT alumni LinkedIn group and the MIT Sloan one. Good. I'd encourage you to join this if you, if you haven't already done it. So LinkedIn says that when you are making connections, when you're reaching out to connect with people, um, your most powerful connections are your family and your friends. Second to that would be alumni, your fellow alums. Third would be shared work experiences. And then fourth would be um, volunteer or community involvement. So as you think about the people you're connected to on LinkedIn today, I would encourage you to kind of look at those four categories when you grow your network. All right, should we look at profile? Sure. Dive into profile? Good. All right, so we're gonna start off, whoa. That is very that loud. It's really loud. Um, we're gonna start off by talking about how you can have a complete profile. How many people here are at the all-star profile level on there? Okay, we're gonna get, at, at the end of the session, and feel free to have your laptops open today if you brought them with you, we wanna get everybody to the all-star level. And one of the reasons you wanna be at a complete profile level is because you are 40 times more likely to be found by somebody looking for someone with your skills and experiences if your profile is complete. Think of it in terms of when you do a Google search or any kind of search engine. What do you look at in the beginning when you put in your key terms? You look at the first few pages of results that come in. When a recruiter or hiring manager or somebody who's utilizing LinkedIn's corporate talent solutions puts in terms for their search, they tend to look at the first one to two pages of profiles that are returned. And your profile, if you meet the terms, will come up higher in their search if you're at the all-star level. So let's talk about how to get there. And before I dive in, let me give you a couple of disclaimers. Oh, yeah. The first one is LinkedIn changes on an almost daily basis. Bryn and I try to do a really good job of being on top of every single little change, but 99 times out of 100, we've missed something that might have just happened. And I feel like LinkedIn watches the schedule of when we do presentations because almost every time Bryn and I get together to do this, and we've done it now about a dozen times, that week they've rolled out some new feature that we're scrambling to learn midnight before the presentation, and that did in fact happen today. Um, so roll with us if there's a few things that might be uh, changing as we speak. If you see something that you have a different idea about, please, this is meant to be interactive, jump in, correct us, add your perspective. This is meant to be very interactive. The second thing I want to note is we're going to show you some really good examples of profiles that we think are strong or great headlines, summaries, things like that. That does not mean you want to copy them word for word. <laughs> that is, in fact, plagiarism. And we want to make sure we're giving you ideas and suggestions. But use your own voice, your own skills and experiences that best represent yourself. Um, you'll also notice that, because we'll use our profiles now and then by default, um, Brynn and I both have premium accounts. We are not advocating that you need to have premium accounts. We have those accounts right now because we've gotten good deals on them, and we also are trying to explore every feature so that we can, in fact, give the best job advice as to whether or not you need a premium account. The features we're going to showcase today are not 
part of the premium package. So just keep that in mind. We believe that you don't need to invest in the premium account for most of the fantastic functions that LinkedIn has to offer. And we'll cover the premium yeah, account at the end if we have time. Yeah, pros and cons. All right, so how do you get to a complete profile? One of the first ways to do it is you need a professional looking photo. We've handed out a checklist to all of you, and the first few items on the checklist will show you if you do all of these things, you will achieve all-star status. So professional looking photo is one of the first places to start. LinkedIn tells us that you are 11 times more likely to be viewed if you have a photo attached to your account. And there's lots of different reasons why you do want to do this. If you have a very common name and people are trying to find you, they may remember you best if they see a photo of you. Um, you want to use a nice professional looking photo. If you're really actively job seeking, it may not hurt to invest in having a headshot taken, but it doesn't have to be professional. Make sure it is actually a headshot, um, something where you're going to be recognizable. A recent photo is always preferable. Um, something that you, represents how you look now. Um, smiling. <laughs> smiling, happy. What do you want to look like? You want to look approachable, serious, um, professional. You don't want necessarily other people cropped out or you know, doing something less than professional in the picture. You're trying to get a job or a business connection, not necessarily a date. So do you keep that in mind when <laughs> choosing right. your photo. Um, the second thing that you need is a current job title and headline. And we're going to show you a couple of good samples, but keep in mind this should be keyword rich. Your job title, and when I say keyword rich throughout this conversation, we're talking about the words that are going to be weighted in a search. And the words that you use for your current title or your headline are heavily weighted when LinkedIn uses the algorithm for the corporate talent solutions partners. So, what words you use will be very important. And throughout your whole profile, you want to have great keywords that align with the profile you're trying to portray. You don't want to overdo it. There are some LinkedIn experts and blogs that you'll read that have talk about really packing it with the keywords that you want to come up. And that doesn't come off as being genuine, authentic, and very readable. You want it, but you want to use good keywords that reflect the skills and experiences that you possess and that you're trying to attract. So, some places to get ideas might be the profiles of people who currently have the job you wish you had, or the job descriptions that you're applying for. Are there good keywords in there that you want to make sure your profile reflects? Um, should we take a look at a couple of good yep. attention-getting headlines? Can everybody see that? Um, Rob is a Sloan graduate, and his title, I'll read it off, says, Disciplined Self-Starter with Deep Research, Operations, and Business Development Expertise. Anne's headline, Anna's headline says, Operations and Supply Chain Program Manager, Inventory Planning, Inventory Systems, System Rollout. So She's doing the keywords. She's right. got the keywords yeah. baked in there. And Brian Franklin, not a Sloney, but an interesting headline we thought we'd mention. His says, I've helped seven companies reach $1 billion. Who wants to be number eight? Definitely attention getting. And gives you a little bit of a flavor of what Brian has to offer and maybe tells you a little bit about his personality. So think about a catchy, attention-getting headline, something you're comfortable with, but that will also attract the folks that you're looking to uh, have read your profile. Because I would say most people do use their current job title, right? And that is, that is fine. But that's a different approach that you might want to take. All right, so after that, you also need a current location. Now, location could go a couple of different ways. It could be where you're currently located, or you could also include the location where you hope to be working. So for current students, we often tell them if you're here in Cambridge now and not sure where you want to go, use the Cambridge address. If you're hoping to move to San Francisco and you want to show up in San Francisco employer searches, use that location. Um, so there's a little bit of flexibility there. Industry. This trips up a lot of students in particular, but hopefully not so alums who are not sure of what their industry is. Then, uh, MBAs tend to struggle with management consulting, investment banking. And we always tell them, the management consulting folks don't mind if you put investment banking, but the investment bankers mind. So when you can only choose one, choose the one that you think you're most likely to go to or the industry preference. Um, after industry, we want to look at information on at least two past positions and your current position. So you'll need to have 
um, at least two roles really fleshed out. And we talk about using the content directly from your resume. I wouldn't use it in its entirety, but the basic content, some of those great bullet points you worked on with the CDO that are rich in results and impact and quantifiable wherever possible, it doesn't have to be exhaustive. This does not have to include everything you have in your resume, but the really key metrics or impactful experiences that are going to represent the transferable skills you want to highlight is a good way to start. Question? So I've worked for the same company since graduating five years ago, and I've had two, actually three different positions within the company. And then prior to Sloan, I had a number of positions in a different field, but it still represents a different skill set. When you say these two positions, given that I've been with the company for the same period of time, would you say that those are the three positions I've had with my current company, meaning my current position in the last two, or would you encourage people to show diversity? And, and that may change, of course, depending on how long you've been out of school, but I, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on kind of how long, how far you should go back and um, what you should emphasize. I'll give you a quick answer. I'm sure Bryn might have another good perspective. I think what you want to start with is thinking about what you're trying to portray. Are you trying to attract employers or are you looking for business development? Are you simply trying to build your network for when you might need it someday and reconnect with friends? The positions that are most relevant to your longer term career goals are the ones you're going to want to really focus on and highlight. Those two positions could simply be two different roles you've had at your current company. And you can input it as such so that it does make you qualified for the all-star level. Um, but I think those past experiences, especially if they were with really interesting companies and showcase another diverse set of skills that you want to represent, you should include as well. You may not include as many bullet points and as much information about those. But I think if they're relevant and important to you and you love telling those stories and you also want to reconnect with those former coworkers, definitely include them on there. No, that's fine. Other that's thoughts? Good. Okay, great. Yep. All right, we'll keep going. Um, education is really critical to have on there. It, it, do include your undergraduate education as well as your graduate education. Some people may have also gone to a particular high school that they want to include or a summer program. You know, be as thorough as you'd like under this section and do include things that are relevant and important like great courses, projects, activities, leadership experiences. GPA, testing scores, whatever you think is relevant for your stage and level and career and important and you know, stories, again, that you like to tell. Include those things under education. Now, the next uh, bullet here is talking about three skills. You need to achieve a complete profile. You need to be showcasing at least three skills. Would you say seven to 15 tends to be the average? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I wouldn't go more than 10, but you pick yourself. Yeah, we, we like 10 is a good magic number. Now, let's talk about endorsements while we're here. How many people here have been endorsed by someone for a skill that that person has absolutely no idea whether you can do that or not? <laughs> Everybody? OK. So Brent and I have met a number of times with the folks at LinkedIn and to people who have developed this feature. And they said, we know, we know. And we're, we're responding to it. And we're reacting to it. And I said, well, what is the best advice we should give our alumni and our current students? And they say, think of the endorsements in the aggregate. What are the skills you're most being endorsed for? What do people really believe in that you have? If there's a real hole and no one's endorsing you for a skill that you've put in there, maybe that's something that you can't credibly say you have or something you need to make sure other people know you can do. Um, think about you know, it in the aggregate. Don't fret too much. I, we do say, though, actively manage your endorsements. And there's a lot of new ways that have rolled out recently that you can see. Should I jump? Yeah, I would, to that? I would go ahead and look at it live. And look at it okay. So I'll, we'll look at my own profile for lack of um, login to any of your accounts. <laughs> so under my endorsements here, I can actually manage which ones show up higher or lower. Um, if there's a skill that I really want people to know that I have and I haven't had a lot of endorsements for it, you can encourage colleagues to, if you believe I can showcase a skill, would you? endorse me for it. Another great way to get endorsements is when you endorse others. People tend to reciprocate. Um, but you can also entirely opt out of having your endorsements visible. Some people are totally uncomfortable with the way this is um, being portrayed on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has created an option to opt out of that entirely. Should we show yeah, that? Would show it. Yeah. All right, so under edit profile, these things become an option. 
Um, so we can edit where they appear entirely. You can even opt out of being endorsed entirely. Does that make sense? So why, why yeah. Why? yeah. Does that mean immediately yeah. if I see somebody who has no endorsements, my immediate reaction is he's not endorsed, not right. He, he or she chose to have no endorsements. I mean, I think there's a lot of people on LinkedIn who, or some people who aren't going to be looking for a job, don't, aren't using the, the site to try and, uh, you know, build their, build their career. So they just don't want to have anything to do with it. Because frankly, I would just say this, it's kind of a game. It started, it, it started out as a way to maybe get third party credibility for skills that you think you have. And it's become a game in a way because, um, you know, you have people endorse you who don't know that you have that skill. Um, so. I think some people just want out of it, right? What we tell people is pick those skills that you want to be known for, especially for our job seekers. Pick those skills you want to be doing and then actively have people endorse you for those skills, be a generous network and networker, endorse people for their skills. At some point, I do think these, the number of, of endorsements you have will factor into the recruiter um, search results. Right now, it does not. Right now, the skills are part of the keyword search feature. So when a recruiter is doing a search, it's, ba it's basically keyword driven. So skills are part of those keywords where, you would, where it would help you increase your, your, your ranking. But um, I think that the number of endorsements are going to factor into it at some point. So we're, we've been saying, just get ahead of it. Pick those skills, manage them, get endorsements for them. Hunters, that if you have more endorsements, it's better. So I've, I've been asked by people, would you endorse me for this <coughs> and this? Because I've been told I don't have enough endorsements. So it, it won't rank in the algorithm when a corporate talent solution subscriber is doing a search for you. However, that's not to say headhunters are not using them when they make a decision about whether to call a candidate or not. I work at LinkedIn. I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Yay! <laughs> we have lots and lots of companies tell us that they ignore the endorsement section because it is it is a game. Yes, yeah. um, we have other headhunters tell us they look at it. So um, I think it's, it's something to manage. If you have 80 or 90 percent of your connections endorsing you for a certain skill, I would seriously question whether or not that's a true endorsement or if that has been gamified by you in terms of in terms of you actively reaching out to your to your network to be endorsed for that skill. So I wouldn't I wouldn't start this whole can you endorse me for this too heavily. Um, you might want to elevate a skill because it's it's, it's you're adding it to your to your um, profile. But um, I would not try to game it so far right. that it starts to look unnatural compared to the mm -hmm. that you have. Right. Um, your mileage may vary. It's also very market dependent. Um, behavior in the US is very different on this than, okay. than in Europe, for example. Yeah, and there's a lot of, of, of our, our European students who don't want to do this at all, right? They're just not. But even in yeah. the US, we are. I mean, we, we have, internally, we have serious conversations about the value of endorsements and how, yes. to, best, yes. how, how to actually turn it into something which is meaningful yes. by we know. linking yeah. in data that we have. Um, versus versus making something which is just a very it's it's too much like the light picture mm -hmm. yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it makes a lot of people yeah. uncomfortable yeah. Mm -hmm. it does which is why we're so happy that you finally just within the past what it's only been within a month you introduced that edit um, yeah. feature to opt in or out which is good and and I just do want to qualify we're not telling you to game the system we're not okay. everything we want you to do should be authentic and genuine. If you don't believe somebody has a skill and they've asked you to endorse them, don't do it. Don't ask people to endorse you for a skill that you know that you genuinely don't have. So um, we want you, when you're creating your profile, to be authentic throughout. So, What do you do at LinkedIn, if I might ask? I lead a sales support team which sells the advertising which is related to um, talent branding and employment on, on the site. So um, oh, cool. if you ever run across an advert that says, you know, picture yourself working at this company or follow this company for employment opportunities, that is what my team helps to support in the field. We're probably only partly intimidated now to know that you're in the room, but <laughs> no, we I shall proceed. Great. I think it's great. It's one more person we can talk to. We have a product manager and then John Hill, who you probably know. But thank you for <laughs> chiming in. Okay.
Uh, after endorsements. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll do, do a that? sample of that right now. So I'll pull up Bryn's profile. Will you endorse me for something? No. And so I'm looking at Bryn's profile, and I think I've endorsed her for almost all her skills already. But um, so here are the skills and endorsements Bryn has. If I want to endorse her for interviewing, I simply click on the plus. The ones that already have a plus are ones I have already endorsed Bryn for. You can also do it from the top so that you don't have to scroll down. If you go to the um, drop down, oh, send a message. So hit that drop down. I think you should be able to endorse yep. there too. So that's that's another way to do it. But you're correct you, to have it. The LinkedIn used to have to have a complete profile. You had to have endor You had to have a recommendation. I think, um, and now that's no longer part of having a complete profile. So skills has replaced that. So you're correct about that. Yeah. All right. The last item on terms for a complete profile is that you need at least 50 connections. LinkedIn does tell us that 100 connections seems to be the magic number when the network starts to really begin being highly effective for you. And we'll talk a little bit about making connections and what more in a few moments. But Great. Um, let's move on to some additional right. profile features. So you have on your LinkedIn checklist that top part is what you, know, you need to have to, to get traction in recruiter searches, what you need to have to get to get a complete profile. Some other things we recommend. First of all, a customized URL. Does anybody know what this means? Maybe you can just show it. So, oh, your first connection to me, so you won't see it, actually. Okay. If you can go to somebody who's got a, who's it has it right here, though. connection to you. Nope, that's not it. Oh, it, oh, that is it. OK. Huh. That wasn't there the other day. I just want to tell you, it was not there the other day. We, should we, should we, we find out after the release as well? Yeah, so yeah. All the release of stuff, and we go like, oh, it's changed. Uh, we're doing a sales pitch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it used to have, it used to, sure. Um, it used to be in the, it will be, if you're not connected to somebody, it'll, you will see it on their screen. But if Chris and I are first, are connected directly, so you won't. But so when you create a LinkedIn account, LinkedIn gives you a www slash LinkedIn.com, your name, and a bunch of random characters and letters, okay? You can customize it, though, truncate that to just be your name. Um, and maybe we can just quickly show how to sure. do that. So you would go to Edit Profile. We'll do a lot of stuff in Edit Profile today. It'll go to Chris's profile, but that's fine. Chris also has a, a URL, so you hit Edit. And then on the right-hand side down here, you'll see that you can customize your public profile URL. And she's put in her name. For those of you that have more common names, you might have to get a little bit more creative. Um, but then now, as you see, you, she sets that. And it's a nice little package. So this is actually critical for a couple reasons. First of all, you're going to enhance your search engine optimization from doing that. As, um, as you said, you know, we know companies are Googling you. You will elevate your Google search ranking by customizing your URL. Over 1 billion names are searched on Google every day. 94% of the people only look at the first page. So you want to do that. Um, and LinkedIn ranks higher in, those, in Google and Bing. Uh, than any other social media site like Facebook. So um, definitely do that. What I tell our students and our alums, add that URL to your email signature. For those of you who are doing you know, informational interviewing or might be networking or reaching out to people, it's a nice subtle way of encouraging them to click on your profile and find out a little bit more about you. If you're going to be contacting somebody that you might not know that well, trying to do business with them, um, it's nice for them to be able to see a little bit more about you. It's a lot less aggressive than attaching your resume if you're a job seeker. So that little URL can be very valuable. I've even started to tell um, alums and students, if you feel confident in your profile, put that URL on your resume. Take out the physical address, phone, email, LinkedIn URL. People are going to be looking you up anyway, so you might as well make it easy for them to find you. OK? 
Okay, so that's a, that's um, a huge, I think, plus. The second thing is the summary. I would love to hear what you have to say about the summary because I, I talked to a lot of the recruiters who come to Sloan about what they love about LinkedIn profiles versus resumes. The picture is always mentioned, but I've had recruiters tell me a compelling summary makes all the difference to them. It keeps them scrolling through a profile. So I would not recommend that you kind of cut and paste the objective or summary statement that you might have on the top of your resume into LinkedIn. LinkedIn affords you the opportunity to be a little bit more personal. I love the first person voice, in fact, and we'll look at a couple of um, really good summaries, I think, or summaries that, that I've worked with um, alums where they've gotten some good traction from them. Essentially, a summary can be your pitch, right? You can talk about who you are as a professional, what you do well, how you could add value, and if you do it really succinctly, um, and in that first person voice, I think it's a lot more engaging for the reader. I think it also allows you to really um, bring your own voice and deliver that. And coupled with a picture, um, it's much more dynamic than a resume, right? Um, just a couple of um, options I have. Maybe we can again, switch. Yeah. So I'll give you a second. Can everybody read that or should I read it out loud? This is a. a Sloan grad. Should I read it out loud? Yes. Okay, sure. Having grown up in startups, I've had the chance to play in all technical functional areas, from product development to applications engineering to quality system development. Keyword, keyword, keyword. But the work I have found most professionally satisfying has been focused on improving manufacturing systems. I think the capability to execute and improve business processes reliably and consistently is the critical factor that separates top companies from also RANs and I am excited that I get to work in this area every day. I bring a deep technical, quantitative, and business background to my work, but I don't use numbers or data to beat anyone up. It took me the better part of a decade to understand that lean culture change is about respect for people, and the best SPC slash Six Sigma slash 5S analysis is useless if there isn't buy-in. I enjoy combining the challenge of driving lean manufacturing initiatives and continuous improvement culture change in highly technical processes and regulated industries. If it isn't difficult, why bother? And then what he's done here, to the point we said about keywords, he's actually adds, added some keywords, called them specialties or expertise. So, I mean, I, don't you want to meet Mike? You know, if you were looking at his profile up against other profiles that might not have had a summary, would you find this compelling? And here's the thing too, this is, I think this is the hardest part of a LinkedIn profile to create because it requires some really deep reflection about what you've done in the past, um, how you've made a difference, and, and an ability to convey that in a succinct way, but also in an honest way. Um, but he spent a lot of time on this, so, and, and he has, has told us um, that, that he's gotten a lot of great feedback on it. So. Can they? So, Mike, is that, uh, you know, that strikes me as a little on the long side, mm -hmm. but um, so what are your feelings yeah. on that? So, actually, I, I, so what I have said um, is tr think about it in three parts. Who am I as a professional? What am I good at? Or what are my areas of expertise, right? What are my skills? And then if you're a job seeker, it might be how can I add value to, this co to my next opportunity? How can I contribute? Um, there is a limit. I think it's like 2,000 characters is your limit. Um, and some people use all that, but no, it's hard to read. So I think three good paragraphs is, is good. I'll show you another one. Um, this is only one paragraph. So this is uh, another alum, Lisa. I'll read it. I'm an accomplished business leader with more than 18 years of experience in asset management and investment banking. I have successfully designed and implemented complex complex business plans and strategies for large firms and startups alike. I excel in taking big ideas and turning them into reality. I'm a problem solver, a people person, and then parentheses, a team leader and player, and a nerd. Wait, we're all uh, MIT grads, right? Uh, use data in technology to make decisions and am a self-taught developer. I have an extensive global network and awareness of cultural sensitivities and rich experience in working with people from all over the world. So. Um, so she can, she, you know, that's her paragraph. Um, and, and then I know other people too. I've got other, I've got so many other samples. We, we kind of, in the interest of time, only went for two. But uh, I think it depends on the person's personality, right? Some people are just talkers. 
Some people are more succinct. So do what feels uh, best for you. But I do really encourage you to think about that first person voice. I would also think about using your first person voice when describing your work experience too. Um, we've had people, I don't know if Lisa did that here. Will you look down, Chris? Or, oh, that's a screenshot, actually. Um, but sometimes when you, when, when you talk about yourself in first person, it's so much easier. So I led a dynamic team of XYZ rather than led team of engineers. Um, well, she doesn't have it under there. Okay. Hers are really brief. So um, no, Lisa did this and Lisa did that. No. I do not like the third person voice, especially with LinkedIn. You know, this is your chance to really engage and connect with somebody. And I, and I also, it's a lot more work, but I wouldn't use the bullets either. That's just me. You can do it. If you have the right keywords in, it'll be fine. Some recruiters don't care. But I think you should take the time to make your LinkedIn profile different than your resume. And using the first person voice is the best way to do that. So, and as we saw in the headlines earlier when you were going through profiles, the guy who had, I helped um, seven companies achieve $1 billion. So he's taken that to the headline too. Some people think that's a little bit too. You got to work with what resonates with your personality best no. and your industry as well. You know, when we talk about, there's a lot of things um, with interviewing that's similar. Um, when we talk to students who are interviewing with investment banks, we say, you know, the attention span is a little bit more limited. Shorten your answers. You know, the management consulting firms, you can go on about three minutes per answer. So think about this too with regards to your industry. Uh, folks going into more artistic realms or graphic design, public relations, communications, media, they may be a little bit, and you will need to take a little bit more creative license with how you approach LinkedIn. But for maybe financial services, you might want to be a little bit more buttoned down, bullet pointed, and succinct. Mm -hmm. Good point. Know your industry, right? So what's kind of the um, thinking around how you represent I, right? In some cases, <coughs> you as an individual might have contributed to a broader outcome as a part of the team. And uh, why, since it's a public profile, me claiming success for 20 other people who have contributed it, yeah. so it kind of can come across and drop the wrong way or it's a good your work. So what are the questions? So his question is, how can I claim contribution for something if I worked as part of a team? I say talk about working on that team, because that teamwork is essential. So I worked on a, on a brilliant team that created XYZ. That's how, I mean, be honest, right? But use that to your advantage, actually. No, so my, my point is less oh. about kind of, so teamwork is part of it, right? But I think it's more about if you are the leader of some effort or you're being a change agent or whatever it is, right? So yes, you're a player critical role, but you do not want to say that the other person did not. So the thing is, right. it's, it's being the wide receiver. So yeah, you've made a winning touchdown, but probably there are 200 other people or five or 15 other critical blocks that happened earlier in the game. So you want to kind of acknowledge that it's a team, but mm -hmm. you also acknowledge that you are the star performer of that game. So is there kind of, have you had, not from recruiters, but the peer group on how it has affected the friends? My peer claim things that I have done. I would be offended and I'll say, okay, I'll change the relationship with that person and how he or she is perceived. And he's not giving credit for my you really would, Yeah, I wouldn't worry about what other, I, I would think about how you can portray your skill set and you can say, I was a change agent working as, working in concert with, you know, my, my fellow team members or my department, I help do this or that. I wouldn't, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Would and it? You can spell out what your specific role was within that team, but the point you raise is an interesting one and one of the reasons why companies love LinkedIn. People tend to be more honest than in a resume that they think only a hiring manager is going to read. They know your coworkers may be looking at this. And the other thing too that might happen with LinkedIn is you claim you worked on this project and um, as the hiring manager, I might say, wow, I know some people that worked on that over at XYZ Company. And I might pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, did you work with, what's your name? Roger. Uh, on such and such project, because I'm thinking about calling him. And someone may say, he had nothing to do with that project. You may be getting reference checks without even knowing it when you have this information on LinkedIn. And because of that, people tend to be very accurate and authentic. That's a good point. Another thing you can do, too, though, is you can tag team members. 
And that's a really interesting thing to do because by tagging the people that you worked with on an academic project or in a work environment, you are showing the depth and breadth of your network expertise. And those team members then, when tagged, may say, I'm going to write a, a recommendation on this person for working on that project together. So tagging team members is another interesting way mm -hmm. to show authenticity in an assignment. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and we're going to show that in a second if you want to tee that up. Yep. I'll just go through this, um, make this point really quickly. Um, we do recommend for people who are actively seeking work to use that, that phrase somewhere in their profile, probably in their summary, right? It could be the last part. I'm actively seeking a new opportunity in product management where I can leverage my skills, blah, blah, blah. Um, because that is a, because the LinkedIn recruiter package, whether it's the smaller package or the corporate talent solutions, are very keyword driven. And they, and oftentimes, if people are looking for just-in-time talent, they will put in actively seeking or um, something akin to that. So, next. Um, I can only imagine that companies are also doing that to see what their own people are doing. You jeopardize. Yeah, if you're not if you're not if you're doing a confidential job search, I would in no way recommend that you do this. And actually, you know what? To that point, let's show how to change your privacy settings. Sorry, we should have done that at the beginning. So, anybody who has a LinkedIn profile, you're going to come here. Re go to your privacy settings. And so I would, everybody do this afterwards if you're going to change your profile because it, it, it will help people. And then go to turn off and on your activity broadcast. If you uncheck that box, then when you do add a photo or you do check, it, people don't necessarily see that. So if you want to do a confidential job search, I would definitely um, do that. And there's some other privacy controls you might, you might want to check out as well. So we won't go through all of them. but. Um, but in general, too, because you're all going to leave here and go and make your profiles more complete. Um, right. But you don't want to make like change your photo and two hours later change your headline and then keep. And every time you do that, show up in the activity feed of all your connections. So turn this off. Get your profile to where you want it. And then if you choose to, turn it back on again and do that. Um, so let people see you made a change when you're really ready for them to take a look at your brand new profile. And for those people who don't want to use link, you know, who I had mentioned earlier, kind of by creating a profile, you're putting yourself into a global resume database, right? If you want to opt out of that, there's other privacy controls you can do so that you're only viewable to your connections and you don't, you know, you don't need to be endorsed, that sort of thing. So um, the other, the other highly recommended profile edition. So um, LinkedIn has created a lot of other fields in the past few years as an answer to the growing number of, this, of students who are joining LinkedIn who may not have um, extensive work experience. The one, the fields you have not are, are all on your LinkedIn checklist at the bottom. We do recommend that if um, a certain field is relevant to you, that you take advantage of it if it's appropriate. Probably for this population, you don't need to put test scores anymore. I wouldn't recommend that or courses that you might have taken. But if you speak languages or if you are involved in any organizations or have volunteer commitments um, or if you have published things or have patents, definitely do that. So again, you'd go to the edit profile section. Anything you haven't done would be on the right hand side. So if Chris wanted to, can you just hit plus on the projects? We talked about earlier tagging teammates maybe on work projects that you've done. She could put in the project she did, what role she was doing um, when she had it. Then she could tag and add, team, uh, put a URL to the project, and she could tag um, team members and add other people. So if they had LinkedIn profiles, you would see that show up. So um, in addition to all these fields, too, in each section of your profile, you can add rich media content now. That um, if you have a video that you've done or a PowerPoint presentation that you want to add or a website, um, that is linked to that. You can add that right there and it will show up with a graphic too. So um, again, you know, being able to add and pack all this content in can be so much richer than kind of that standard two-page resume. So think about um, taking advantage of those things. The other thing I want to make sure, because a lot of people will create their LinkedIn profile and then not update their contact information. So in your contact information section, if you want people to be able to find you, um, again, this is only seen by your first degree connections, but have your current telephone number, your email. Do you mind going to that? Um, you are able to add up to three websites, a Twitter hang handle, a blog, um, chat. So um, take advantage of those things too. And then let's just talk about recommendations. So we have this, when we do presentations for MBAs, we, we, we have said, you know, if you get one strong recommendation, it could be helpful. I would say that too, but it is hard to get to your point. 
Um, but if you have somebody who can write some, a recommendation specifically for you, not a blanket, mat, um, like you can tell it's a mass recommendation, right? If they can speak um, uh, very specifically to value, the value you've added or contribution, if it's from someone significant, your manager or maybe a successful employee, it couldn't hurt. I wouldn't get tons of recommendations for every position. It just makes it that much longer. But if you do get it one key recommendation, it could help. So, all right, yep. Um, a lot of recruiters will check if you've also recommended the, the, the other person. So um, any mm. mutual recommendations will typically cancel out because it looks like, again, they yep. gamified the system. Tip for tap, yep. Right. Good to know. Yep. Mm. Thank you, that's good to know. All right. So, all right, so that is, that's kind of the quick and dirty on profile. So again, as Chris stated, our goal is to get you to an all-star profile. So that's what, to the right of your profile, do you want to just show them there's a profile strength meter on your profile. Um, we want to get you to all-star. By, by filling out the terms for a complete profile, um, you will get there. Um, oh, you do need to get to that all-star profile to show up in a recruiter search, I would say. Um, and did you give the stats that LinkedIn says you're 40 times more likely to come up in a recruiter search if you have a complete profile? Um, again, your profile should be clear. It should be concise. It should be authentic. It should demonstrate your strengths, um, and it should clearly show the value you've, you've added in your past work experiences. Um, we talked a little bit about keywords. Want to be clear for us, we're not advocating keyword stuffing, but you do want to be thoughtful about placing keywords in your profile to help maximize the chances that you'll be found. So, any Two oh, questions? Yeah. Oh, questions on profile, yeah. Uh, one other question I had is on confidentiality because sometimes word project that you worked on or even endorsements companies have policies around yeah. marketing and yeah. So what is the thinking or thought process? So your, your question is about po co companies are now imposing restrictions on your ability to solicit endorsements or no. talk about projects or confidential so work? A, or projects, talking about work that you have done, which is, pretty, is considered confidential. Yep. And number two, even endorsements, for example, I know my company has policies on public endorsements, so I have a strict HR policy around whether we can or we cannot give recommendations publicly, especially folks who work for you. <coughs> Okay. You have to adhere to those yeah, policies. You just have to adhere to yeah. them again. <laughs> no, but do people expect, like, so how do they protect the work that is confidential? Like, I'm not saying break the policy, so do people talk about it in generic terms? Does it actually work? Like, is it, make it, is it better not to talk about it as, as opposed to talk about it in generic terms to the broader population? You know, like, do people I think it depends on a case-by-case -case basis, and we get this with resumes as well. If, if it's highly confidential, you're going to need to leave it out. And the people in your industry will know that, you know, maybe you work in defense or whatnot, and it's a highly confidential area. If you can talk about it in generic terms so that you don't have a gap on the profile, then do so. But th these are things that are kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, and you might have to, you may even ask your manager, are you comfortable with how I've portrayed this information on my LinkedIn mm. profile? That's a good point. Yeah. How did you get to the profile display? That, oh, right that's there. on viewing my own profile. Looking at her own profile. But yep. not in an editing capacity. Yep. So go to your own profile and scroll down, and as you see, Chris has this all-star. Do we have to be premium? No. No. And we, I mean, yeah. we have premium accounts, but everything we're showing you it, it goes with a basic account. Thank you. Okay. How can you right. customize URL? Is that why we need? No. Nope. I can't find, find it on the app. Yes. It... Okay, so the app is more difficult. I would recommend working on your, doing a, only on a desktop when you're making changes to your profile. Not everything um, that you can do on LinkedIn is available via the mobile app. We're hoping it will be soon. <laughs> we'll see. And the same with the iPad app. You can't do it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. You can't endorse on the mobile app, too. So. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just wondering about your recommendations. It appears that my recommendations have fallen out of alignment with the actual positions. Oh, okay. And, I'm, you know, and it, it actually appears that most of them are now at the end. So they're not, you know, in dispersal of the job, and uh -huh. they're at the bottom. And then I want to change it because a couple of the people that are recommending me are well known in the valley, and I'd rather have their names pop up mm -hmm. than a 
and ones that are there. Okay. Do we have a way to manage where these recommendations are placed? So I believe that when you look at the recommendation, you should be able to show what work experience it was for. And then um, I think it will always show at the bottom, but it should come up. Maybe that's, uh, that might be a one-off that maybe we could look at with you afterwards. I think I don't want to, yeah. It used to be the, the same, you know, uh, on a specific job yep. position, that's where the And it still, it still is. So that's why the, it's, but then they're also at the bottom. So we could maybe look at that offline. And then the other question on recommendation, so if you have like a well-known personality and in, in your industry is recommending you, and they've moved from Apple to say no-name company, now nobody knows what no-name is. And what happens, I think the way LinkedIn works is now it no longer says, you know, so and so, XVP and Apple. Correct. Yeah, it says, carries with you. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you don't know that this was a luminary, you know, this is a new place and nobody's heard of. So there's no way to, because he's changed position, there's no way to so go through their LinkedIn to see that. Because I noticed that his recommendation changed. Well, it's the company the, changed, so therefore the person's name. Uh-huh. So because they yeah. changed their own LinkedIn, my recommendation mm -hmm. now has changed and you don't see the decision. Well, hopefully in the recommendation they would say in what capacity they worked with you and they in what right. what role they were in. But yeah, that's, that that's just the way it goes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Here, here's a quick example of mine. It might be hard to read, but Achal Agarwal, who is now at JD Capital, starts out by saying that I helped recruit him to JP Morgan. So he makes the reference in the first line. It's not a perfect system, and you just have to kind of work with it. The same thing, if someone writes a recommendation for you that's full of grammatical errors, I always suggest not publishing it to your profile. Not, none of your recommendations will show up until you've given approval for it to be included in your profile. I have plenty of recommendations that are not published to my profile, either because I don't think you should have too many. It looks like you protest too much, um, like you're trying too hard. Um, I think just a couple is fantastic. And if, if there's a really good person who's written you one with a couple of errors in it, it does still reflect upon you. And I'm very anal retentive about no grammatical errors in the profile. So you, do, you can go back to them if you're comfortable enough and say, could you make these changes? You can't make the changes yourself, thankfully, but you might ask the person to do so. Mm -hmm. um, really quickly, I am going to just show you, too, uh, one more thing about profile. If you go to edit profile, these arrows help you click and drag sections. So um, you can choose which section you want to display the order. I like summary, then work experience, then education. Some people want to have their skills up top. Some people want to have other things up top. But you do, in every section of your LinkedIn profile, you'll see an arrow that you can use to click and drag up and down. That's one last thing. Yep. So one suggestion on that is um, about the fold, real estate is limited. Right. Whatever uh -huh. you put on your profile, you really want to make sure that the most important statement is above the fold. So it also ties to the, the summary, length of the summary statement. If your summary statement is too long, it, it starts to push things below the fold. And a lot of people don't scroll. They look at what they see, and then they move on to the next profile of their recruiter. So um, yes. having the most important stuff there is the way to Yep, go. absolutely. And then if you have a compelling summary, though, if you do something really good, it will help people scroll. I've had several recruiters tell me that. But why is it? Oh, why is that? I don't know. We'll find that out. Um, yep. So on, on my LinkedIn profile, uh, I have some publications, and you know, I have some things that I've published. Um, and I put them above my work experience because I figured, well, you know, everybody knows that there's work experience there. So if they see those things first, which they don't know are necessarily there, that's going to be an advantage to me. Um, and so is that a good strategy That's a great strategy, right? Yes. Yeah. And you can, you can add lots of rich content and media-rich content um, to your profile. You could add videos, um, links to articles you've been quoted in or have co-authored or authored. You could add um, LinkedIn, two years ago, was it, bought SlideShare. And um, adding SlideShare content is a fantastic way to showcase your work product, your original voice, um, show that you're a thought leader. So think about adding some of those things. In you don't want to go over the top, but ways that might really demonstrate the value that you could add to a potential organization. You know, the, there's a lot of limitless opportunities here. All right, we're going to keep pushing on. All right. We have a lot more to cover. <laughs> so the next area we want to talk about, though, is 
how to actually expand your network. You've got the great all-star profile and you're ready to start reaching out to more people. And the power of LinkedIn isn't necessarily in the people that you already know and that you're connecting to. The power of LinkedIn is in the, poten the people that you have the potential to meet. Your second and third degree connections. That is where you're really going to expand the depth and breadth of people that you can start working with and connecting to. So here's some thoughts on ways in which to uh, expand your network. When you're going to start reaching out to you know, former coworkers or friends and family, other people that you know or have volunteered with in the past, we recommend always personalizing the request to connect. And as of now, you can only do that from your computer. The mobile apps don't work for personalization. When you connect to, um, when you click on connecting, you're going to send an automated response. Take the time to write a personal note to each person. If it's someone you haven't spoken to in a while, you may want to remind them how you know each other. And to that effect, Bryn and I strongly recommend only connecting to people that you know, like, and trust. We don't recommend connecting to anyone you've never met before. You're giving them access to your Rolodex. Everybody here, I assume, knows what that image is, right? The Rolodex, which is a thing of the past. We do this presentation for some students who give us a blank look and have never seen this because things like LinkedIn now exist. But um, personalize every request. Take, show the person that you're taking the time to care and write them a note and ask them and mention to them, highlight for them possibly, why you'd like to connect with them on LinkedIn. Another way to find other people that you might want to connect to or maybe jog your memory about former coworkers is to browse the connections of your connections. And maybe they're not people that you necessarily want to link into, but they might be people that you want an introduction to and maybe reach out to for an informational interview, a coffee or such. And you can then ask for introductions. Do people here know, does everyone know how to ask for an introduction? Raise your hand if you'd like us to walk through that. Can introduce them. OK, great. We'll start with, and there's kind of two ways in which we like to talk about building your network. One is, um, or find people. One is getting introduced, which we'll walk through. And the other is, I like to call asking strangers for candy. And that's reaching out to alums that you don't know yet. But we'll start with getting introduced. Um, anybody want to give me a company that you'd love an introduction to? Anyone? Throw out a company? Any company? Apple. Apple. OK. So what? Oh, no. OK. Thank so uh, <laughs> thank you, Julie. <laughs> that wasn't a plant. Um, so I'm going to type Apple into the main search field. OK, and I'm going to look for people. All right, so as I go through, um, over 600,000 results come up. And the ones that are going to show up first for me are my first degree connections. So Dave Rivers um, comes up, and he used to work at Apple. He might be a great person for me to talk to about other potential people to beat at Apple. I'd prefer to talk to people who are currently working there. So I'm going to go down here and click on current company. My search results look a little bit different. Um, Melissa Lloyd comes up. And it tells me that I have one shared connection with Melissa. That shared connection is Greg Marsh. I know Greg really well. Now, hopefully, every person that comes up is someone that I can say I know really well. Um, Greg and I went to college together. He used to be, he's much younger than I am, but I've met him at alumni events. He used to be the head of recruiting at Google. And when I started working here at MIT, we'd get together for lunch all the time. I'd be really comfortable asking Greg to introduce me to Melissa. So what I'll do here is, I'm not going to click on connect. I don't know her, but I'm going to ask to get introduced. Since Greg is the only person we have in common, it's the only option I'm given. But I'll click, click on Greg, um, type in maybe potential or request for introduction. And then I'll type a note to Greg asking him to introduce me to Melissa and why I would like to meet her. Now keep in mind, and LinkedIn now points this out, Greg may simply forward that note to Melissa. And so I want to be really careful about what I say and keep that um, option in mind. He might also pick up the phone and call Melissa. My friend Chris Bolzan would really like to meet with you. I'm going to give her your email address with your permission. Um, he could do a couple of different things. He could also facilitate that introduction via email. Keep in mind when you're asked to make introductions that you want to be a generous networker, which Bryn mentioned earlier. And be kind and generous in offering introductions to other people. It's a really great way to connect resources with one another and to then further your own network. 
So if I wanted to go through with this, I'd simply send request. Greg would receive it in his inbox. He would receive an email notification that he's been asked for an introduction, and he can take it from there. If I don't hear back from him and it's a really important introduction I need to make, I might pick up the phone and call him. And you could do that also. You can take it offline and call the person or email them directly and talk about why you'd like to be introduced. Make sense? OK, now there's a whole other way then we can look at how might I find other people at Apple. And we're going to go into the um, net alumni networking tool. Mm -hmm. Could I this just is, interject? Sure. What if you do not have a premium account? Do you still you, have that capability? Yeah. Everything we're showing you, nothing is, everything we're showing you is for a basic account. Yeah. This is a fantastic tool that I hope will remain free. I wonder if LinkedIn will eventually try and charge for it. But for now, it's I saw really, a grimace over there. It's, it is okay. a really great tool. So have people uh, raise your hand if you've checked this out, the alumni tool. OK, good. We love when we're showing you something new. Um, so I went to Wesleyan, but I'm going to change that so this is relevant for all of you. Um, oh, sorry. OK, I went under Connections, Find Alumni. So this is the alumni tool. Some refer to it as John Hill in a box, because he was one of the folks at LinkedIn who created it. But I'm going to click on MIT. You can also do Sloan, but MIT has 85,000 people on it, whereas if you go to Sloan, it's just 20,000 around. So. OK, and then I can do a search um, a number of different ways. The first people co that come up are the people from MIT that I am personally connected to. And we can do um, a keyword search. I always recommend making the date parameters as wide as possible. Would it be better if I put this on the center screen? Or? Yes, but it makes me nervous because I think that I need Ken to do okay, that. OK, we'll leave it there. <laughs> All right, so let's say um, you can search by where they live and simply click here, uh, where they work what they do, there's some other options as well, what they studied, what they're skilled at, how we're connected. But let's go, we'll do a keyword search and I'll just type in Apple. Let's try it. Yeah, okay, good. We can do Great. That. Good. So we've got uh, 1,330 people pop up. And we can then look through and browse briefly the information that they've shared um, in their headlines. And then you can see your mutual connections by up here. So if you do have connections, they'll be in the top right hand. They recently changed this to make it a little bit more emphasis on the picture. In most cases, it'll tell you what year they graduated. So it's a great way to make it really easy to find people that you might want to potentially be introduced to. Or as alums, you could reach out to them for a coffee or an informational interview or um, whatever it is that you're seeking. I've had alums get great traction if they're doing a job search and they're trying to break into a company or if they're just trying to get information. So keep in mind, too, I don't think we said this, every word in your LinkedIn profile is indexable and searchable. So if you just wanted to type in product management into that key field or product manager or something, it would show you everybody who has that word in their LinkedIn profile. So maybe you're just wanting to talk to different people in an industry or think about functional roles, but you know, you can, th and then, you know, say you have, you want to be in the San Francisco Bay Area, so now you further filter those results. So this is a really rich tool for getting business leads, for n informational interview. Oh, sorry. So this is product manager in the greater Boston area. Somebody in the room showing up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's say you want to simply get to the decision maker. So let's say I'll type in CEO. Somebody give me a location. All right. Oh, all right. We'll, we'll do DC. It's a little smaller. So we've got 200. Oh, yeah. There we've got both of them. So we've got over 1,100 MIT alumni who have CEO. It doesn't necessarily mean they are the CEO, but uh, who have CEO somewhere in their LinkedIn profile. And you can take it from there. So everybody see how this works and how helpful it could potentially be? Current students love it. Um, I've seen a lot of, I've been talking to people recently who've been using it for fundraising and business development for their organizations. Um, it's a fantastic way. You want to do this, you can do this for your undergraduate institution. Recruiters use it all the time if they have very specific schools they want to recruit from. Um, so again, another great reason to make sure you're always listing the organizations um, that you've been a part of. Is the, is the number there sort of 
indicative of uh, connections or anything? Right here? Number is your yeah. comp, yes, your mutual connections, yeah. Okay. yeah. So if I mouse over that, I'll see, you know, uh, Vic and I both know Drew Harry. And so if I want to get an introduction, it tees it up right there, how I might be able to get in touch with him. So this is like fortunate for me, all these folks, though I didn't graduate from MIT, are popping up that I know we have a lot of people that we know in common. And interestingly, they have nothing to do with the work that I've done here at MIT. One more question. Can you accept an invitation but not make your connections available to that person? Because occasionally I get things, I go, why in the world am I getting something from this person? No, you actually, you, it's all or nothing. So you raise an interesting point. And this is one of the reasons why we say only connect to people that you know, like, and trust. Because you want, you're opening up all of your connections to them. And they are, you can only choose one option, either to let all of your connections see your connections or don't let anybody see them. And you want to, you know, if you're going to want access to their connections, you want to play fair and open up your Rolodex to them as well. But you get requests that look like phishing to me. Well, so you then, absolutely so then you don't, we That's do what, not yeah. recommend I, accepting I those. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I wanted to know if I had an option. That, you know what I have done when I've seen a request like that of somebody I totally don't know and can't imagine? I've said, and if I'm really curious, I'll send them a note and say, I'm not sure if we know someone in common. I've gotten notes back saying, you don't remember me? We went to high school together or something like that. And like a re sometimes that recent picture doesn't always help. <laughs> but um, you know, and if you're really curious, then I, instead of accepting the request, you can send them a note. So whenever a recruiter asks me to connect, I always do. Is that a wise policy or not? It depends on what your um, career outlook is, right? <laughs> if you want to be open to opportunities, then connect. But keep in mind the way headhunting works. They may then browse all of your connections for other potential ideas. So sometimes I would respond to a recruiter, and I've told students to do this. You might say no and send them an, an, an email, say, can I have your email address? I can send you personally my resume if you'd like to keep it on file. So headhunters don't love that response, but if you're a really good applicant that they're going to want um, access to later, they'll respond appropriately. Then you also want to qualify that recruiter and figure out what kind of firm they're working for, but that's a whole nother session <laughs> on, on headhunting and recruiters. Okay, we'll do one more question, then we're going to try and wrap it up. Anymore. I've tried to find yeah. a delete. Oh, you can just remove connections. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's actually, and I have one more thing I did think was helpful. If we, if, can you look at one of your connections and then, um, oh yeah, no, it's easy. It, actually, go to your, are you on your, your I'm on my connection. This is the new connections page. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go, go to your connect. Oh. Right? What? Wait. It changed recently. Okay, go to add connection or keep in touch, really. Okay. So click on Tim Winters, right? Um, to remove him, you would just hit this and you would see a remove connection. If you do the down by send message, you should see a remove connection. Go down a little bit further. Oh, remove connection. And then it just disappears. But one other thing I wanted to add before we moved on, because I think this is really cool. It does not send them a message. It does not. It just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we should show the relationship tab. Oh. So this relationship tab is really cool. And the contact info. Good point. Yeah. Um, with everybody that you're connected with, you have, that you're connected to, you have the ability to add notes about that person, to set reminders to follow up with them if you s need to reach out to them. Um, write yourself a reminder how you met. Tag your connections. I highly recommend, and it's only visible. It says this information is only visible to you. It'll also show when you connected with the, the person. But this is really cool. I mean, it's basically a CRM system that you can use effectively. Um, and I had a point about that, and I just lost that. Oh, tagging. I highly recommend, especially for people who have hundreds and hundreds of connections, to create tags for your connections. What that means is you can create, um, based on 
your undergrad group, work experience, location, so that if you did want to filter your connections, so I had a friend who recently moved to Colorado. I lived in Colorado for five years. I have a Colorado tag. So anybody, I took a look at all my Colorado connections to see who I might be able to pass on to her. So when you're managing hundreds of connections, I would say it's wise to take the time. It also helps you clean it up. You know, now that we've said only connect with people you, you, want, you know, you recognize that you might be able to, to tag them and make it a little bit more organized from the outset. So. Yep. Yep. Tag. Or you can. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you'll have to click on the that box, and at the very bottom, you can remove connection. So. Are, are we'll you on a profile of someone that you're actually connected to? Yeah. You have to be with somebody that's a first degree connection. That's a good point. Um, what, the sales folks love this contact information tab and uh, the relationship tab because you can put things in there like, you know, is married, has six kids, or ask them about their dog next that was sick next time you talk. Like you can keep all these notes in there about important things that are really hard to remember or to keep track of elsewhere. So it's a phenomenal tool for those things. And setting reminders, if somebody says, I'm going on vacation, I'll be back in 10 days, call me in 11 days, set yourself a reminder so that you'll, you know, it won't slip through the cracks, particularly in a job search Attention to that level of detail and timing is very critical. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm not no, I sure. Don't know that. <laughs> I'm a little weary about the app. The app is. I mean, you should get the app, and I think you know most people log on through the app, but you don't have the same functionality on the app. So the app is great for things like just-in-time networking, and you know, right before an interview, you've just got the interviewer's names. Look at their profile before you walk in the room, or you're going to a networking event. It's it's great for things like that, um, but for really managing your account, go to your computer. Yep. Yeah, so that's a good segue into the next part, which is how to get um, insights into people, into companies, into job opportunities. So as Chris just said, if you're interviewing somebody for your company or if you are going to an interview and being interviewed, make sure you look up the LinkedIn profiles of everybody that you're going to be meeting. It can help you craft talking points. It can help you with questions. If you're going to be speaking at a conference or you're attending a conference, look up the, com the companies that will be there, the people that will be there. Um, it can help you be better prepared, right? Better informed so that you can maybe establish rapport with people or if you're going to be pitching your company or your business, you can go ahead and get some um, talking points ahead of time. So the bottom line is, you know, make sure you're using LinkedIn to look up people. This used to be creepy, right? But it's not anymore. People expect you to do it. And LinkedIn, it's not like you're looking at somebody's Facebook account. Uh, LinkedIn is a professional networking site. So it, in many ways, you know, it could give you um, insider information on somebody, give you an in or a, or a talking point that you might not otherwise have known ahead of time. Um, yeah? You, I think you answered my question, which is five. It's not creepy anymore. But <laughs> when you research somebody who you don't, who's not a contact, especially an interviewer, they'll most likely know that you've looked them up, right? Because well, you can change that in your privacy settings, and you can choose to be anonymous. Yeah. So when we showed you earlier that privacy setting, you can um, either have be completely anonymous if you choose to do that. Just know you're not going to be able to see who looked at your profile. Um, you can be partially. Um, Viewable, so maybe your your job title or your company will show, or you can be fully you can be fully available. Yeah, but you know what? I think sometimes that can help. Sorry, to your point, when I was talking about, you know, if you're sending emails to people and you've got your URL and your email signature and you've sent an email and you know they've seen you, you know, then you know you might have gotten in, you know, you might have gotten some traction. So just think about um, both of those things. Did you look if they have a premium account? No, no, no. Right. Everything we're talking although, about today although is Although you see more. <clears throat> oh, yes, you'll see more. That's when right. you have a premium account. So yeah. you, you see 90 days back, and you see 100% of the people who have viewed your profile. You only see, I think, seven days, um, seven days back, and you don't see 100% right. of the profiles. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. But point. most hiring managers and recruiters do have upgraded accounts. Well, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I do want to touch on the subject of career mapping. We, we flesh this out a little bit more when we talk to the MBAs, but I think it's really important for anybody at any stage of their career to, to use LinkedIn. Um, if you're thinking about where you might want to be one, three, five years from now, right? the roles you might want to have or the companies you might want to work at, you should use LinkedIn to look at people who currently hold those positions that you might want. See how they got there. What 
jobs led them there? What certifications might they have? What organizations do they belong to? And that can kind of help you figure out how you might need to position yourself. So when we're talking to students or people who are maybe trying to change industries, right, that can be very helpful. Um, to look at the profiles of people whose jobs are interesting to you, to help you figure out what you might want to do yet, do next. Um, using LinkedIn for career mapping is also kind of a really cool uh, thing to do. I also had a student recently who really wanted to work in a, or an alum actually, who really wanted to break into an investment management firm. It was a small firm, and he said, oh, they only hire Harvard MBAs. You know, it's created by a Harvard MBA. I'll never get in there. So I was like, let's look. Let's take a look at the company page, which we'll do next. And you can see everybody on, who works for that company who has a LinkedIn profile, who has their privacy settings open. And you know, we were able to kind of dispel that myth. So I think it's good for kind of confidence building too, or just kind of a reality check, maybe that's the more accurate term, in terms of where um, you're at if you're trying to make a, another move. Um, so let's look quickly at the company pages. There are three million company pages on LinkedIn. Excellent opportunity for a company to brand themselves, but also great for you if you're trying to gather some intelligence or knowledge on a company. So um, this is not as robust as it used to be. There used to be other features that you have, but now the home page will show you recent um, company updates, might give you information on products and services that the company may offer. Or what company are you on? Let's go to Apple. Um, what I think is most valuable is any company page, and we'll look at Apple's, will show you your connection to that company. So, you know, if somebody's not an alum and they, you can't find them on, on, an alum, on the alumni tool, you could come here and see that Chris has um, 281 second degree connections to Apple. So these are the people she has the potential to meet. There are almost 80,000 employees on LinkedIn, and if you click the see all, to the right, then you can see them. And then she could see how she knows them, right? So when we were talking about getting introduced, that's another way to do it via the company page. Um, so she has an idea, so she can now see all of her second degree connections. So that's a really valuable um, way to use the company page. The other feature I like on the company page, if you go back to it, is there's a section called companies also viewed. So companies who looked at Apple, or people who looked at Apple were also looking at Google, they were looking at Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon. So if you are trying to maybe widen your swath of target companies, that might be a nice um, thing to look at. I would also recommend following all the companies that you're interested in. Um, it will go to your news feed, but it's also just um, a nice way to possibly get insider information before, before it's more publicly available. Um, I'm going to move along quickly. We'll just touch briefly on the jobs tab. So I have a coworker, Marilyn Cronin, in the career office. I'm not sure how many people might remember Marilyn. She's been there for a while. She's great. And she always says job boards should be used for market research, right? It tells you who's hiring, what they're hiring for. But you know, we, we always advocate trying to do a networked approach to, to job hunting. Um, I would say LinkedIn has probably for an MBA, right, the best job board. Um, you could use. I think there's a stat, um, I don't know if LinkedIn posted it, but it said 77% 77, 77 of all jobs are posted on LinkedIn, so for what it's worth. Um, and I know they are trying to surpass Indeed.com in terms of being kind of the largest job aggregator site, so um, it's getting a lot of momentum. The cool thing about the jobs, um, oh, and let's look at a job. So if you go to advanced search, you can type in a title, keyword, you can also do an advanced search. Now, the premium package, you would need to pay to see salary levels, but you should be able to do a job. So let's just get to a job. If anybody has a, would you like, let's just go to product manager, keep it moving. <laughs> um, the cool thing about their job board is when you see, click on it, just any job, so maybe the senior product manager at Thomson Reuters, if you're looking at that job, you should be able to see who posted it. So perhaps it's, this looks like a recruiter, but sometimes it's the hiring manager. Helps you with addressing your cover letter. Also, if you um, apply, you can apply on LinkedIn using your LinkedIn profile only. So not a resume. You can upload a cover letter. Um, if you hit apply now, you'll see. So, sh so she can apply with her profile and have the opportunity to update her profile and then upload a cover letter if she wants. You can also see similar jobs. So maybe you haven't, something else hasn't caught your eye, but on the side you can see similar jobs, okay? 
I always like that it tells you how many applicants they've oh, gotten yeah. so far. That's right, 20 and applicants clearly, for that job. Premium feature. Oh, that is a premium, it is premium. feature. Okay, that, thank you. You know, I don't, but. It didn't um, used to be. Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it, it used to say how many people had looked at the job description, too, I thought. But now it's how many people applied. So, um, so that's the job board. Do you want to keep moving? We are, we are getting we're close. At, we're almost out of time. Yeah, we're kind of let's out of time. Brandy. Yep, let's skip it. Yep. So um, maybe we should just go to the premium feature, just highlight that, and then we'll wrap up. We'll go to that slide. Yep. Yeah, we want to give you a couple minutes if there's any lingering questions. We had some other thoughts on Use LinkedIn online Pulse. branding. <laughs> Um, some of the news, LinkedIn has tried to really make a move to be more of a content provider than just a social network. So there's a lot of different ways to get news and information, but we really don't have time to dive into that. Um, but a little bit of basic information about LinkedIn Premium. Is that helpful? Yes? Yeah. Okay. And again, this, this through changes. That? There's different types of accounts you can get. So, you know, I had mentioned their largest source of revenue is from corporate talent solutions. Their second largest is from premium subscriptions. So that's, um, so that's and, they, and then there are different packages you can get. Um, I'd say, as we have up here on the slide, competitive analysis, sourcing, sale, these are, these are reasons that people might purchase it if you're a, um, in business development or sales or if you're a headhunter or a recruiter. Um, there are different packages that you can use. Right now, the advantages of those, I would say, is that see who has viewed your profile, which we talked about earlier, right? You can kind of see if you're getting headway with people if you reach out to them. Um, also, there are some increased search capabilities, as we just saw, the salary levels, and maybe even seeing who's done it. Okay, so you're looking at the plans, that's good. Um, so you can, get, you can get different ones. And then um, in-mails. So in-mail is like an in, intra-mail system. So if you don't have somebody's email, you could still send them an in-mail versus linked, um, through LinkedIn if you're not connected to them. And those are things that you might get a certain amount of in-mail per month. And LinkedIn says you're guaranteed a response or you get refunded that, that in-mail. I want to tell you, though, there is a feature that I have found. It's a LinkedIn account called Personal Plus. It's not featured here. If you go to LinkedIn.com, Personal Plus, it's only 10 bucks a month. And you can see who's viewed your profile. You can be part of LinkedIn's open link network, which means you'll receive, um, anybody can contact you for free, so they don't have to pay to send you an email. Um, so it's really affordable, which is why I think it's not as visible. But, um, but you know, it's $100 a year. So for those of you that might be thinking about maybe trying to get a, be more present on it, that could be a, a more affordable feature. So, so LinkedIn.com slash personal plus, yes. When you're saying you can see who viewed your profile, but if you are an anonymous state, even if you have the upgraded account, yes. you can still see who yes. were anonymous? If they chose to be viewable, yes. Right. So if they were anonymous and you have premium, you still can't see me. It'll say uh, viewed by an anonymous user. Yeah. It will say that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change sort of that give you additional access. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. You, uh, the user always gets to choose um, how they will be viewed. Yeah. So, all right. That is, it's 12 o'clock, so um, thank you so much. Oh, yes, two, please. Two, two quick thoughts. Um, following companies, um, if, you're, if you, a recruiter approaches you and sees your profile, they will see if you're following the company or not. They, you get a little icon next to you, which is why following companies is pretty powerful. Huh? Um, companies definitely prefer to hire people who are already followers. Um, we see a different increase in that. And um, a lot of the content on LinkedIn, such as calls and influencer posts, are under interests. It's yes. um, a well-hidden yeah. content yeah. area. Um, you probably will have noticed in the walkthrough that a lot of features are actually hidden inside drop-down menus and are not necessarily apparent. It is it is a voyage of discovery, just like slow bus. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but I really would. We had more planned on this. This is a really great content um, platform. Great information articles, influencers, top industry leaders are posting. So check that out if you haven't. And, and so. some, of our, some of our alumni are actually um, influencers. So yep. Mark Rowan, who's yep. class of 99, is, is an influencer yep. on the platform. Yep, MIT Media Lab founder. Um, the last thing is this link here will take you through your guided profile. So if any of you haven't seen that already, when you log into link, um, if you hit that, it'll prompt you to log into LinkedIn, and then it will prompt you to fill in different sections of your profile. So that can help you with profile completion, but you already have your checklist, so you don't need that. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah.